are listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 148 is Rod Abernethy. He released his first album in 1975 called Solo. He was the guitarist for the band Arrogance. He was on Star Search, has written many pieces for video games and commercials and soundtracks. You're right now listening to Driving to Dan's, one of the tunes from early on in the Rage original game soundtrack 2011. But in recent years, he's returned to his original love, being able to play live with acoustic guitar and often singing. So he's released three albums in that style. We will be talking today about the song My Father Was a Quiet Man from his brand new album, Normal Isn't Normal Anymore. Then look to the first album in that series, 2018's The Man I'm Supposed to Be. The song we'll be talking about is How to Forget. And then we'll look into his video game soundtrack work by considering two pieces from the Hobbit original video game soundtrack 2003 and Finally, we'll return to the new album with an instrumental, Whiskey and Pie. For more information, please see rodabernethy.com. Enjoy the show. So I will play Driving to Dan's from the Rage original game soundtrack 2011 as just an example of this combination of the acoustic and the computerized. And it's funny that when we get into your three solo albums here... It's just purely, maybe there's an electric once in a while. There's nothing that resembles any of the fancy electric guitar work that I hear on many of your video game samples. No, there isn't. It's a whole different bag. Well, do you want to tell us a little about this? It's a really interesting shape to your career that you've got this album solo from 1975 that actually has (laughs) some of the sonic elements of what you're doing now. But then uh, after being lead guitar in a band for a while, then just went straight into being a chameleon, doing these soundtrack things for video games, for TV, for film. And then uh, it's just been in the last few years, right? And it had some albums, formal album releases with that sort of soundtracky sound. But then just recently that you've kind of come out as the Troubadour again. Can you say a little about that recent journey here and, and what you're doing with this new album, Normal Isn't Normal Anymore? I started out as pretty much a folk guitarist. I played electric in bands, you know, in high school and stuff. My influences are, you know, like everybody back in late 60s and 70s, Hendrix, Clapton, the list goes on and on. But when I started getting into acoustic guitar, it was Leo Kotke, John Fahey, John Renborn, Paul Simon, all the acoustic greats, James Taylor. And that has always stuck with me, even though after college, I joined a rock band arrogance and we were more of a pub band i I can't really classify what we were doing but it was electric some alt country influence but a lot of what we called pub rock and then i joined glass moon which was a genesis type band and then i went out on my own which i was trying to be kind of a new wavy guitar guy and that was the band i lost on star search with then i decided to be a composer and that's where All the orchestral elements came in because I studied classical music at school. And I left the guitar behind, except when I was doing stuff like Rage, some really, not heavy metal, but hard rock-based stuff. And I love that. It's part, it's in my blood to play electric guitar, but it's in my heart to play acoustic guitar. I've always had that in me. And about six years ago, it was more like eight years ago, I wanted to get back into acoustic guitar, and I made that conscious decision to do that and to not compose as much and start playing because it was time for me to get back to it. And I had some people going, well, what are you doing? I went, I want to play acoustic on stage again. That's what I started out doing. That's where I want to go back to. So then we have an album in 2018 that's got a, an instrumental side or is it a double album, technically? What? It's a double album, and it's got an instrumental album and then the vocal album. Yep, and then the uh, 2020 album with all instrumentals and the new one that is mostly vocals. Can you say a little about where you're at with Normal Isn't Normal Anymore 2021? The song we're going to discuss is My Father Was a Quiet Man. Well, that album, you know, I came up with long before the pandemic. I was on the road a lot, and I was talking to people you know, about how they were feeling. This was like three years ago. And and people that I talked to, they were, you know, it's just different these days. I don't know where it's going. And I'm not just talking politically. I'm just talking about everything. So I started coming up with the concept of normal isn't normal anymore. 
and wrote that song and then wrote another year, which is sort of goes in depth with storylines about homeless people and people that don't have insurance and immigration. And that was before last year when all of a sudden all this stuff was really hitting hard. And I almost didn't come out with the album because I thought this is too topical. But friends and family and my manager said, no, release it because it will probably hit home. My father was a quiet man came about after a dream I had a couple of years ago during the holidays. And my dad, who had passed away a couple of years before that, he was on the phone and he sounded really young and he didn't talk that much in real life. So he was talking to me and asking me how I was doing, what was going on. I thought it was kind of unusual, but it was, it was cool. And I woke up the next morning just thinking, man, I need to write a song about that. So here's the song. This Christmas Eve I had a dream My father was reaching out to me He was standing near the fireplace A younger man I could see his face I could hear his voice and it felt so real And we talked for hours there in my dream My father was a quiet man And sometimes hard to understand In church when I was only three So tall he stood there next to me He held a hymnal open wide It was there his voice could ring a mountainside We took a trip to Spartanburg In his 57 Thunderbird We walked into the music store He knew exactly what he was looking for Had an intuition about his son Somehow knew the man he would become And in his own quiet way He handed me my first guitar that day Years ago my brother passed away And the angel spoke to me that day When I walked into my father's house He was standing there reaching out He gave me such a long embrace Quiet tears were falling from his face And I learned how strong a man can be When death befalls a family Yes, my father was a quiet man And sometimes hard to understand I look at him, I see myself In a photograph upon the shelf I watch my son, now he's 21 A father someday will become And I hope someday he'll understand 
How sometimes I can be a quiet man. My father was a quiet man. So this is interesting. You got five verses. It's sort of what is that a an epic poem style? In other words, like just stanza, 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 as opposed to you know, there's some movement within that, so that there's something like a chorus. In other words, the last two lines of each one, but it's more you know, this could be sixteen verses. This could be, but it's you know, driven by the narrative. Can you say a little about how you structured this? Was this an on paper thing first? So with this song, I wasn't really going. A- at it with a structure in mind. I was kind of going at it with the flow of thought. I guess it's not a traditional kind of verse, chorus, verse, chorus kind of thing, if, if that makes sense. I was just kind of letting the train of thought come out. And I didn't know where it was going to end up. And when I came up with the line about my son at the end of the song, I was just like, wow, it really, it's working. I'm not going to mess with it. Are there secret lost verses here that you, or, or these were the points you felt like the quiet man thing, is that what sort of brought to mind then the singing in church thing is the second note? You know, I'm sure there's there's a lost thought in there that I can't pull back, but it pretty much came out. I have to give a credit to my wife, Suzanne, because she helped me with the end of the verse about going to my dad's house after my brother died. And when death befalls a family, that was a hard line. I think Suzanne actually came up with the word befall which is not a normal word for me to sing. But once I did it, I went, okay, yeah, that says it. It kind of came out the way it came out. And I'm glad it came out the way it did because I usually detail stuff. I can't let stuff go. I'm known for being too much of a stickler about stuff. But this, when it came out, I just kind of let it go. Okay, there it is. It's that transition from... You've got this memory of hearing him sing. You've got another verse of getting your first guitar. And I'll point folks at the video for this, that, you know, the fact that you have actual family photos illustrating this, it just really drives home that this is your actual remembrances. This is not, even though it has a little bit of a hymn-like quality. I mean, the fact that it's interesting that this actually happened on Christmas Eve, because when you start with this Christmas Eve, I had a dream, and you're doing the strong, like, it makes it sound like this has the feel of a Christmas song, you know, because yeah. <laughs> just it's already this warm fire that you've established with the the acoustic. There's going to be something a little bit hymn like. I mean, it's still personal, but I had picked our second song that we'll talk about in a bit, How to Forget, because that is also a very sort of direct personal statement. But it is almost more direct, more personal, just in its style. Whereas this has a little more of a I'm playing something pretty in church kind of feel to me. I say that because my father, a folk guitarist, I mostly saw him in church growing up that he would do (laughs) concerts. So that's what it's just connoting for me. But, you know, yeah, using the term like befalls, like that is natural in that setting where that would not be natural in in the the other song in uh, How to Forget. I guess when I came up with that idea, I was thinking of kind of Christmas song because it does start out with Christmas and But those are the memories. The strong memories for me are Christmas and church, which I'm not an extremely religious guy, but I remember those times in church with my dad, and he was a giant with the hymnal singing. I remember that. And the first guitar is definitely a strong memory because I didn't really know why we were going to the music store. I thought, well, we're going to look at some guitars, but he had a plan. And then my brother passing away, And then, you know, the inverse, which is kind of passing the torch to my son. So, yeah, there's tons of other memories that I could have put in there, but the song was long enough as it was, and those memories seemed to work for me. Interestingly, so you mentioned the 57 Thunderbird, which putting out, like, the name of a vintage car like that has, you know, has a very long tradition in country songs, that kind of thing. But there's no, like, the name of, it's a Gibson, you know, there's no, the name of the guitar, interestingly, that that would be an equally, I don't know, maybe too much, uh, if you put both of those in the same verse, <laughs> might be a little too much. Well, yeah, I wasn't going for an endorsement deal or anything. <laughs> it's funny, that 57 T-Bird, I love that car, and he offered it to me 
at one time. He said, I'm going to sell it. And I didn't take it. And man, I regret it so much. It was a great car. And it just kind of came up because we did. We went to Spartanburg and it's Thunderbird. And it seemed kind of romantic in a way. Let me just play the intro for folks. Just that you have to measure throughout here, am I going to finger pick or am I going to strum? Or you could have done you know, an overlaying guitar to have both, but I just thought that was an interesting intro that it's kind of like two measures of three and then you extend it out a little. I mean, I assume you're just kind of writing with your fingers in this case. I remember actually strumming when I was playing it, like through the first time I actually got the words and everything, and I was finger picking it like a folk song. And I thought, it needs a little more push than that. And then I started strumming the whole thing. It wasn't the kind of song I wanted to strum the whole thing. My father was, you know, it didn't work then. So I kept the intro finger picking and then broke to the strum just naturally. And I thought that's kind of weird. And then I kept doing it and it just sort of fit and then go back to the picking. And the fact that you're introducing that the palm stop, the strum on the new chord, you know, that this is kind of the you're getting a taste of the verse in the intro. That will just give you a little bit and then we'll strum for the rest of it. Yeah. And can you say a little about the, how the arrangement of this came together in terms of there are uh, two guitars in the background, sort of one left, one right, and they're very subtle when they come in or how much they play. Were you playing all these parts or I assume? No. Okay. One thing I did want to say was I'm, I'm definitely love melody and I did want the intro to have the melody in it somehow. So the, the finger picking does do the melody, mm-hmm. you know, da, 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 and then I continue that on. I wanted that to be a theme throughout. And when I talked about this with Nielsen, when we were going over what we we're going to do for the album, he said, let's just keep it all simple. If we do some overdubs, great. Keep it simple as if you're playing it live. And I played that through one time. That to me was a first take vocal and guitar. And I actually teared up after it. And Nilsson came in and went, well, dude, you, you're crying. That's the take. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right, because a lot of times I would go in on songs and he, I want to fix something. And he would say, no, no, don't, no, man, you're going to ruin it if you go in and try to detail it. So he was really good at keeping me at the real performance and not trying to polish it too much. And we kept it very simple, the arrangement. I think because of that. Well, and you can't even like pitch correct anything, right? If you have, there's going to be bleed between the guitar and the vocal. So you just can't, if the vocal is not exactly what you wanted, (laughs) oh, well, it's spirited. You don't have to be that detailed about it. You're right. And I will say Will Kimbrough is such a brilliant guitar player. He's so tasteful. And when he played the break, it's such a simple, it's kind of country flavored, but it's pure Will. That really made it for me because I didn't know what we were going to do during that. Will just came in, listened to it like most all the other people that were there. They listened to it and took a few notes and said, let's go. And a lot of them were first takes. Yeah, let me actually play. Uh, so this is about 320 in. Yes, my father was a quiet man. And sometimes hard to understand. Just that you have that chordal, bah, 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 that's following you. Yep. But interestingly, that's it. It's not like we've established now that there's a choir that's accompanying you and he just keeps doing that. It's like, no, it's just a little thing to set up there. You know, like the rest of the flourishes in this song. It's a lot of just, was it a steel on one side and a... And a that was just Will. Okay, so guitar. Will doing both of those. And often just volume pedaling in or whatever he was doing for one sustain, just to provide a little pad. I will say Will does some of the most tasteful, atmospheric, electrical guitar stuff that I've heard. And it's easy to sit down with a guitar and make space sounds and do stuff. But to make it blend in with something that's already existing, that's a hard thing to do. And he accented stuff. He didn't just play with it. He was Mm -hmm. like the part you just played. 
that's Will just kind of going, okay, and very simple, but suggestive, kind of of a choir. So how much had you played this? You said that the recording was a first take. Had you played this live in front of people in between? Did this get get yeah, some time to do? Okay. I did. All, the whole album. So you kind of knew like that you were going to go back to finger picking during one of the verses. He had an intuition about his son. Somehow he knew the man he would become. And then you go back to finger picking for the rest of that in his own quiet way. You know, so it allows you. So all that stuff was pretty much worked up and pretty much came out the same way. <laughs> Any two times you would play it by this point. Yes. And I was lucky enough to have played these songs for months before we went in to record them. So I kind of had that down. And that's very helpful, too, because I had sung them and gotten reactions from people in the audience. So sometimes you go in the studio, you don't know who you're singing for. You know what I mean? You're like staring at the mic and am I singing for the guys in the control booth or who am I singing for? But this whole album, I knew exactly who I was singing for. It was nice. Well, and also just be able to feel that stuff out. So a line like he knew exactly what he was looking for. We walked into the music store. He knew exactly what he was looking for. Had an intuition about his son. Somehow knew the man he would be. The fact that you made that decision, I'm going to spike the, he knew exactly what he was looking like, that he is going to be the thing, uh-huh. which is not normally, you know, if you were just kind of reciting it. I don't know. That suggests to me that something that you felt out because it's kind of a mouthful, that line. I hear what you're saying, man. And I had sung the song enough live to kind of know what I was doing. It was, I wasn't really thinking about it so much. But when I was getting to learn the song and when I was first performing it, it took a while to know what to do with it. I didn't just come out of the gate going, here it is. It took a few months for me to get it down. No, it's great when you can kind of live with that for a while and then still have feel like going in and recording this that you were able to sum up that emotion and have it be a one take performance. Yeah, it's funny. I don't really think of it that way. I guess because I've sung it so much live from beginning to end that that studio performance beginning to end, it was kind of like I was at just at a gig. I could have stopped and started, but I just kind of did it instinctively. But honestly, first takes, as you know, show emotion that usually you can't get again unless you do it the next day or something. There's something about that first nervous, little nervous energy or just getting it out. It's hard to reproduce. And then the only other arrangement element, there's a little bit of, I assume that's bowed upright bass. Was the player there doing a number of your songs or did you bring somebody in? I think it's Michael Rennie. He's just a great bass player, was one of Nielsen's guys. And he just came in again and just nailed it. I don't even know if he listened to it all the way through. He just knew it. Well, yeah, and it's very understated. Like, if you brought somebody in, I like that idea, like, okay, I'm bringing in a keyboardist, and I have five songs that could use this. You know, now that you're here, why don't you put 15 seconds on this song as well? Because, <laughs> like, there's not a lot of bass on this. It is very much in the back seat. but as long as you're there, as long as it's part of the identity of the album, then it works great. And he did that as an overdub, too. So I did... It wasn't like we were together as a band, but it does sound very band-like that we were all playing at the same time. Yeah, and it gives a nice, the fact that that's the very end of the song. Mm -hmm. Maybe you all were trying to end together, but when one person is bowing, (laughs) like that's the last thing you're going to (laughs) hear. So Right, you're right. Writing this thing continuously with these memories based on a dream, this seems like this was a new type of entry in your catalog. Or do you feel like when, I feel like I have certain categories of songs, no matter how personal they are, they're like, oh, this is another one in this. I do know where you're going with this. And this whole album was a new category for me because the last album, those were songs that I had written maybe four or five years beforehand. I'd kind of stockpiled these songs and for the man I was supposed to be. But this album I wrote for this album, you know, within like a year's time. I mean, the stories, I think, were more concise. The music, even though the genres are a little bit different, I'm singing better on this album. The Man I'm Supposed to Be, I hadn't really sung that much before then because I hadn't played that much. Then I had two or three years of singing and then go in and do this album. So I really consider this one of the best works I've ever done. And I say works and not album because I've done so many different kinds of musical things like soundtracks and commercials, video games. And this was a project that I set out to do. This was a project for me. 
I just was extremely lucky that I had someone like Nielsen to help me let go of it. He was really good at just saying, okay, man, let's just let's go in there and let's do it. And, but Nielsen, I've got a cold. Is it no man's going to sound better? And <laughs> I actually did have a cold before I got to Nashville. And I was had a little bit of gruffness to my voice. And Nielsen's like, man, it's going to sound even better. And it does. It sounds better than it normally would. So no advertisers this time. So I'm going to talk to you instead about supporting this podcast. So I put in many hours for every episode, listening through the artist's catalog, which is usually very fun. Negotiate with the artist on which songs to cover. Write very, very detailed notes on those songs. Often get very nervous going into the interview itself. And there's more time and some minor expense often in obtaining the recordings to insert the interview files get processed and cosmetically edited to sound all smooth by my man Tyler Hislop. And then I always do a full pass, changing up, record my intro and outro, and do the blog posting and social media. So that all definitely adds up. And for the first two and a half years of this podcast, the Partially Examined Life was willing to fund that effort. And so Tyler and I both got paid something modest, but somewhat in line for the efforts associated with the Partially Examined Life. The hope was that I would be able to get so many musical celebrities on this show that would then make the show blow up, be enormously popular, attract all sorts of new listeners to the Partially Examined Life. That has not really happened. So as of two years ago, there was enough displeasure voiced at their continuing to fund my efforts that they kind of pulled the plug on it. So I stopped getting paid altogether. Tyler took a serious pay cut. However, we had by that point discovered the secret of how to get some ad revenue, which is to insert these episodes temporarily into the Partially Examined Life feed. Get all those delicious Partially Examined Life, probably auto downloads. But we've had enough listeners patronize our sponsor, so they're pretty happy they keep coming back. So I'm happy to say that thanks to those sponsors and your efforts in visiting them, this has been comfortably in the black. However, we still owe the Partially Examined Life thousands of dollars for what's happened before that. And though Tyler has gotten a slight bump and I now receive a $50 stipend per episode, really just for the technical work I have to do. I'm basically doing all this for free, which as a grown man with a job is a little hard to justify. So with all this in mind, I'm asking you to visit patreon.com slash nakedly examined music. Sign up to be a supporter of this show. Even if you already support my efforts through the partially examined life, I really need enough of you to show your visible support to ensure this is worth our time to do to maybe stop mooching off the partially examined life's traffic. And this whole summer Looks like there are not going to be many advertisers, so here's what I'm asking you specifically, directly. Go to patreon.com slash nakedly examined music, sign up for a small per episode donation, and you can set a maximum per month for how much it can charge you. So, of course, if you want to do $5 an episode or something like that, great, but you can even just do $1 per episode and say $1 maximum per month. If a hundred people do that, then I will make sure that there is some bonus content posted just for you supporters every single month. So please stop your mooching ways and proceed to patreon.com slash nakedly examined music. Thank you so much for listening. I'm really, really grateful. Now let's get back to the show. Well, let's use that to transition to the previous album, The Man I'm Supposed to Be. 2018, you had an instrumental album in between those, but as far as a progression of songs. So the song that I'd already brought up was How to Forget from there. Do you want to say a few words about that before we hear it? I really... Love this song. It was like one of the last songs I got together for the album. I think it kind of foreshadowed what I'm doing in Normal Isn't Normal Anymore. One of the last things I wrote and kind of recording got together. Again, it's just a message of how to forget. I carried the line teaching my memory how to forget for years, and I didn't know where it was going to end up. But as we did this album, I kind of went, hey, I've got one more thing to do. And I came up with this song, and it worked. And Don was great at helping me get that down. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. It didn't work out. It wasn't meant to be. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder. How could you do all those hurtful things? It's funny how The older I get How those memories burn Somehow I need a way to forget Now it's time for me to learn 
Yeah, I'm teaching my memory how to forget. Teaching my memory how to forget. Yeah, 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 how to forget. I was foolish, oh so foolish, naive and lost in denial. I don't care how it happened. It's all in the past behind me now. I could find myself another bottle and drink all my troubles away. Just to find myself tomorrow morning with no one else but me to blame. Now I'm teaching my memory how to forget. Teaching my memory how to forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How to forget? I miss you. Yes, I miss you. I think about you every day. Forgiveness, sweet forgiveness, is helping. This pain fade away. It's funny how things work out. Sometimes you gotta let these things go. I'm feeling good, so good inside. I just wanted you to know. Now I'm teaching my memory. How to forget? Yeah, I'm teaching my memory how to forget. Yeah, 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 how to forget? How to forget? Yeah. So this is one that made my ears perk up. I'm the one who chose this one from this album. I was trying to put my finger on why, and I think it's just stark, simplistic honesty, even in the way that a lot of it is delivered, that you're very used to having to, for these soundtracks, do something that intentionally sounds cool. Now we're doing the rad car chase music. <laughs> like, and by delivering everything with as much as possible on the beat, Teaching, like that is about just, in fact, the word teaching, there's no way to make that sound cool. No, it's <laughs> spread hard. over. <laughs> so there's something endearing about this, uh, you know, very direct delivery. Is that the thing about that was sort of presaging the new album? That is a hard thing to sing. And I fought with teaching again, like the word befall. I just kind of rolled with it. And also, I was trying to be conversational with it because this song is actually about a person. I mean, I wrote this song directly to a person. And I'm not going to say who it is, but I really mean it. And the words really are true to me. So that's how I can come up with saying, I'm teaching my memory how to forget. And I'm going to tell you, I'm teaching it. I'm teaching my memory. And that's how I try to sing it. The first verse has a little more, just while I'm being picky in this way, about, about the way you're singing things. Actually, I just want to hear a little of the first verse here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. It didn't work out. It wasn't meant to be. So there's something, does the fact that you're putting all those syllables before the beat, like it didn't work out, unlike the later verses where it's, 
I was foolish on the beat. I'm trying to think. Yeah, it seems like the naive and lost in denial. Like all that is just very, very straight. Whereas this one is a little, a little more conversational. Let's say that. Yeah. When I sing, I tend not to fall on the beat sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. But I think we, most of us grew up with, you know, if you grew up in the, 70s, 80s, 90s, people were singing on the beat. We're singing everything we sing on the beat, on the beat, on the beat. Unless you're listening to Bob Dylan or Tom Waits. And this time on this song, I was kind of like, I just let it flow. I think by the end of the song, I am singing on the beat again. But Okay, so we have the bass here. We do introduce the nice country bass, boom, boom, boom. You know, I could very easily see drums on this one. Was there just that that's against the credo of this album? It was, and it was a conscious decision not to include the drums. It seems like we might have recorded something. Hmm. But the more I listen to it, the more I like just the guitar being the percussion on it, just driving it home. I didn't want it to turn into a overly produced song. It's more uh, like I played it live. When I play this live, I'm really going at it. And I'm delivering that message, you know? Yeah, which makes it very natural. I mean, it could just be one guy with a snare. Like, that would still be raw, but... Yeah, and when I'm playing guitar, and I've told people this, when I'm strumming, and you can't see me strumming, but if you could, you would think I was hitting a snare drum. Ah. And I try to accent, I think that comes from playing rock and roll so much. When I'm strumming, I never stop my right hand and I'm accenting the boom, boom, boom. So maybe that comes out in this song more than others. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, in playing solo a lot, got into a very percussive guitar mode so that then when adding back a drummer, it would be, kind of became a thing like... <laughs> I can only work with certain drummers that can actually mesh with that. So their hi-hat can actually work with that. It just adds an extra thing to have to work out. (laughs) That you're treading on their territory is what I'm saying. Right. Well, the right hand with the guitar is kind of an, uh, it's a chaotic metronome, if that makes sense. (laughs) And when you choose to hit the strings, well, that's your choice. But you need to keep that right hand going to really keep the rhythm steady. Was there any method to, there's a little bit of, Harmony vocals in here, but it just is, is again, kind of like the guitars in the last song peaks in just to emphasize one phrase and then goes away. It doesn't, there's a certain gravity whenever you introduce any new thing into an arrangement that like, okay, now from here on there's bass and drums or for here on we're going to repeat the chorus and the second time it's going to just be all harmony laden, but you kind of resist that urge to expand that we're just going to use just enough to give it a bump and then make it go away. Yeah, well, you said it all, pretty much. That was what happened. It was tempting to make it a fleshed out song, you know, with drums, bass and other stuff, but then you're forgetting the message or it's taken away from the delivery, the vocal delivery. I mean, there's a lot more going on here than in the last song just because, so the hook that's kind of at the end of the chorus, let me just pull that out here. My memory How to fall Was that part of the song as written, or was that something that once you got... I didn't mean it to be Beatles or anything, you know, (laughs) it just came out. That was the pop in me going, yeah, 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 but it's more of, you know, inflection of, yeah, I'm telling you, I'm teaching my memory how to forget, I I guess. Well, actually, I'm just referring more to the what the instruments are doing that than the yeah, yeah, yeah is responding to, the fact that it's the violin and the mandolin together doing that little, you know. So that was in the song before they came in, right? Just the way that you were that strumming was, it? Okay. That was definitely, those stops were in the song before they came in, and they accented that. Luckily, they did accent it, and it worked. If you listen to it, you think, well, a drummer would sound really good behind that, too. But I think it's just enough the way it is. Yeah, well, and there's something bluegrass inflected about having a little energy popping that the mandolin is basically doing a banjo through some of it, you know, when it really gets going into the song, keeping a little constant thing, not for very much of the song, but a little bit in there. No, but it's funny you say that because I could hear this tune really up tempo, like I'm teaching yep. <laughs> my memory, banjo behind fiddle behind and the dobro. I mean, I could hear that. Easily. Actually, I'd like to hear that. Well, maybe, maybe you should get this on a soundtrack and they could have you re, you know, pay you to 
re-record it with a <laughs> and have somebody I'm sorry with a real accent you know it didn't work out I'm sorry or get some uh, young country artist to cover you and they can do that they can <laughs> Yeah, they could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything different about the, so I thought this was Don Dixon producing. Nielsen Hubbard was your, on the new one. Was this a fast process making this whole album? Laying down the tracks, we laid down a lot of these tracks with drums, bass, me, Don played bass, and it, it was different. I would say it's not one's better than the other, but at this time, this worked for this group of songs. Mm-hmm. And for Normal Isn't Normal Anymore, I wanted to go in and just play all my songs like I play them live, get that down, and then bring in the musicians and do those overdubs. Uh, Don's great. Don's an incredible producer, and he can translate almost anything that's going on. But I wanted to go to Nashville and work in Nashville, and I loved what Nielsen had done before. I got it like with Mary Gaucher, Ordinary Elephant, his own stuff. Nielsen is a really great songwriter, and I liked the vocal quality he was getting on his vocals, which kind of drew me to him. Well, I guess since you're not working these up with a band, then like you need the producer to sort of provide the sound <laughs> over and above what you're going to do yourself. So let's make this transition to talking about the video game stuff. You have a lot of equipment in your house, are used to r- producing yourself, <laughs> but obviously it was a conscious decision with these solo albums that even though, well, actually, let me ask you this. So the one that, that's all guitar solos, did you at least record that on your own? Or did you also feel like you had to go <laughs> somewhere else to capture that? I recorded that. Okay. All right. Put a mic in front of it. Maybe look on the internet. Of, try, try different distances. There's not a lot of variation here. Give us a little overview. We're going to listen to a couple of selections from The Hobbit, a video game soundtrack, 2003. I thought that was a fun one. And one that I'd actually had experience like playing with my son when he was eight or whatever, <laughs> trying to uh-huh. bumble my way through this game. And of course, you know, unless you're somebody who follows who's in the industry, there's no reason you would know who does what on what video games. It's not like, so the fact, oh, right, that Rage one, that's the same guy that did Hop. Like, no, that would uh, never, oh, yeah. <laughs> never occur to me. But yeah. yeah, can you say a little, this This forces you to become your own studio guy, certainly, you know, to have everything in-house. And, you know, I was reading another interview about you wake up in the morning and just listening to lots of patches and things like that. It's a completely yeah. different mindset than making an, an album of songs. It is a totally different mindset. But with video game music, you have a milestone schedule and you have to go in and you have to produce music on a schedule. And if you don't, you don't get the gig again. I was telling somebody recently that my instrumentals that I do kind of draw on my soundtrack experience. Because if you take a tune like Over the Fence, that's on the new album, Normal Isn't Normal Anymore. It's about my dog running away. It's actually a soundtrack that I wrote on guitar about my dog jumping the fence and <laughs> running away. So it's kind of a soundtrack experience that I would have written in another time and place on my computer with my samples, or we would have gone and done an orchestral score with the Northwest Symphonia, a live orchestral score. So it's kind of weird, but that's the way I, I look at it. Let's focus on this particular one because I just, you know, you've got such a vast library of stuff we could pull from. But I thought this was a nice because there was a so so there's actually two little songs we're going to listen to. And let's just do them one at a time. So the first one is Working the okay. Mill, which is it's two minutes, but some of it might even be copied and pasted. I know, I guess I was reading that for the most part, four video games for this video game, you're like, OK, we need to just make a bunch of like one minute, two minute long things that can just loop because you don't know how long the player is going to be wandering around this area. Right. With most video games, you do have a loop. You're recording a loop. The loop doesn't have to be specifically 30 seconds or a minute, but most of the time you're doing a minute or a two minute loop piece of music that will loop seamlessly because like you said, the gamer is playing it for how long? We don't know. With that particular tune, we had studied so much Celtic music that that's kind of what came out when I thought, well, the uh, audio director, Marsh Shafkin, was a great guitar player. He loved guitar. He said, play an acoustic guitar track for this particular scene. And I came up with that tuning, which is, I think it's a dad gad. It's not anything too exotic, but it just kind of came out. And while I was doing it, I remember going, this is a video game? Wow. Because it was different to me to write music like this for a video game. As it turns out, video game music is all kinds of music. 
It's like film music. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be 16 bit anymore. What's it, or eight bit or whatever no. the, those early ones. No, <laughs> no. And it, it can be, well, it can be anything. And with that score for the Hobbit, we actually took a lot of that stuff and recorded live orchestra for it, which helped it a lot. Cause at that time, orchestral samples weren't really that awesome. Mm-hmm. You can kind of tell it's a sample. We'll actually hear one of those in a second. Let's just uh, get this working the mill out there. I think I picked this. I was looking at your stuff on YouTube and some of the commenters there focused on this in particular, you know, just within the stream of the entire thing is like <laughs> people ended up liking this tune on YouTube. I think there were drug references in the comments. <laughs> I think that was that you could just really chill out to this too. That, that there's something about, but yeah, can you say a little about the, the construction of the rhythm bed insofar as you recall at this time? I can't even tell, like, is this bongo samples or how much of this is? is sampled anyway. Do you recall? I would say that the, I think there's a boron in there for percussion. There might be something else. Is that the low, the boom? Is that the... Yeah, or, that's okay. played live. I actually playing that live. I don't think on this tune there's any real samples. I think we're playing the instruments. There's not a lot of them. There's flute in there too, isn't there? Yes, in sort of the B section, 20 seconds in, and you've got uh, this answering flute. Yep. had a live flute player that came in and, and did that. You know, once you get the guitar track down, you're just overdubbing like any production. You're just bringing people in and overdubbing on it. And you craft the loop after the fact. There are parts that sound like they might be cut and pasted within this, but within the entire two minutes, it's not like the whole thing repeats. It's not that the loop was one minute, that at least you've got some distinct parts here. And I modulate up too. Yes. Yeah, in that part, then there's no flute in that, you know, when you're in the higher key. And then when you get back, we'll introduce that and, you know, have this abrupt ending. I don't know, was any of that polished for the record release or these are actually the samples as they appeared that you just... You're reading my mind because I was just going (laughs) to tell you that that track I had to polish for the record. Okay, all right. Because there were loops. I think there were two different loops for this, one in one key and one in the other key, and it just looped. And then I went in and did that end you know, the little ending for it. So we'd have a track we could put on the album. All right. So I, I remembered this just because this is very near the beginning of the game. And of course, everyone remembers in the story of The Hobbit when he has to go fix a mill on his way out of t- town. Yeah. Uh, but then this uh, second one, Battle in Lake Town, I, you know, we gave up long, long before this. But it's, it's great that you picked this one. So we'd have, uh, this is two and a half minutes. Yeah. But that would have a the full orchestra 
but it still has a little of the Celtic stuff, you know, the violin and the, it does. the acoustic. Um, so it's a nice, nice mix there. Yeah. Any, any sort of words about this bit? Well, the basis of this whole thing is the 12 string. Hmm. And for this whole score, I had a 12 string, but I couldn't play it very well. It was a Guild 12 and the action was really high. Great guitar. But I found a Leo Kotke 12 at a local music store and I got that guitar just to do the Hobbit soundtrack, and that guitar is still here. It's still my main guitar. Ah. So you're hearing kind of a Leo Kotke kind of 12-string. It starts out with the horns and the intro, kind of a little, okay, here we go, we're getting ready for battle, and then it starts with the 12-string and the orchestra. And for me, this is still one of my favorite tracks on the album, because when do you get to hear 12-string and orchestra that much? Yeah, yeah, it would be. A little overwhelmed <laughs> normally. It's not. It's different, but I really, I've always liked it. Right, so this one has that sort of rhythm bed like the previous one did, but it has to be way bigger because it has to accommodate the orchestra, the horns and all that coming in. What's the order of operations? Do you put the strings and horns in using a pad, you know, using just a, a synth patch to just fill it in before you get the real players in? Or well, the way that I work, I usually get a bed, a music bed going, and then I put sample strings and the ideas that I want it to flash out. Then I have an orchestrator that will take my MIDI parts and write them out into manuscripts so they can be played in the orchestra. So with this, I wrote the whole piece, and then I played the guitar and actually played the mandolin on it too. And then I actually put the orchestral part over it. Then we had someone take the string parts, write the manuscript, copy that out for the orchestra. Then we went into the studio and they played to it. So they actually played to the original demo that we had. Yeah. And you're listening to it. Then you mix it in with what you have. So I assume that's a little easier nowadays that you probably can just convert MIDI to something that will put something on a staff Definitely. for you and not have to have a human being. You can, but I don't trust myself. I'm pretty good orchestrator, but I'm not as good an orchestrator as the guy that I use in LA, uh -huh. who's really, really awesome. And much faster, probably. It's just... <laughs> faster, and he's also... He's never made a mistake. And 
to witness a mistake in an orchestra, to see the orchestra have a mistake, it's really not a good mojo to have a bad note on the score. Not a mistake in terms of, you know, trombones don't actually play this low, right? Or a, a wrong note, you got to go over and fix it. So the guy's name is Paul Taylor. He's a great orchestrator, and he's really good at not putting mistakes. He's also a great orchestrator. So is that the procedure for Dead Space as well? Are you using him? We use Dead Space okay. for the orchestration, for transcribing. Uh huh. And uh, he was really good at that, too. And you have to be careful because it's also... You don't want the orchestra to lose confidence in the composer or the conductor because the, once you hit a bad note, they're going, hmm, where's the ba- next bad note? You want to keep things moving along. You also don't want to have to keep going back over or everybody get out your pencil and mark out that bad note. You're on a time clock. You really got to keep things moving. So how many players would you be looking at for like the stuff in Hobbit, do you recall? I think we had 35 overall players for that. Sometimes you would have half the amount of what you would normally have, and then you would overdub it, or you would just go over it twice so it would sound fuller. And so ideally, you've got, you know, just like when you're bringing in the bass player to come and do six songs in a row, you've just got everything for all the songs, hopefully, that they can just go through in pretty much one take Yep. through, you know, you're just replacing this thing. Do they just sight read, or do they at least, like, get to hear the version with the fake strings? Like, this is what you're matching, or does that even matter to them that these, these guys, guys are such pros? Doesn't really matter. Just as the tempo, if the music's right, it'll be right. <laughs> if you get somebody like the Northwest Sinfonia or the Skywalker Ranch Orchestra, they sight read it like nobody's business. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's amazing. They don't have to hear anything beforehand. You just go. And then you might have a second take, third take, third take, everybody's got it. And we're not talking about Shostakovich here. I mean, we're talking about simple, simple stuff, especially with The Hobbit. It's not really that difficult, but you do want to feel for it. And that's why you get the live orchestra, because live orchestra still gives you one more step of feel and like it's really happening. Well, this is really exciting to see this transition from, I don't know, does it, so you're, you're, usually it's, uh, people start doing the, the small acoustic work and build out to working with the big orchestras. I've seldom seen a retraction to, I must rediscover how to play by myself after having <laughs> such resources at my fingertips. It really is that my heart really is in the acoustic guitar. It always has been. It's always been there. I mean, not that my guitar was in the closet for all this time I was doing scoring, but I would at home, after I had put together a minute or two of scores, I'd go home and play acoustic guitar to relax. Or I always thought, well, when am I ever going to get back to it? And then there's another thing, not just guitar. There's something about singing and performing live that's like nothing else. I mean, you know that. You play in front of people, communicating eye to eye with people. There's nothing like that because scoring is awesome. I love scoring for everything, but you're working in a small room in front of computer screens most of the day. You're by yourself. You're isolated. And when you decide to step out and go, okay, I'm going to play again for people. First, you have to have the songs to do it. That took a while. But when I play and I'm playing something like my father's a quiet man and Everybody, I can tell, is identifying with this. And then I have someone come up after and say, you know, I had to get up and leave and call my father after I heard that. And you're like, this is connection. This is why I'm doing it again. That kind of says it all. To say goodbye to folks, we're going to play Whiskey and Pie, another tune from the new (laughs) album, one of those instrumentals, since we haven't heard one of those yet. I really enjoy it. I'll, I'll link folks to the video of you playing this live. Just the fact that there's so much slide, that you have a slide on your pinky. Is that right? I do. Have you gotten the video that I just posted of live performances? I was looking at your, your album release one, but I'll, I'll look for the newer one. They're on YouTube. Do you have a few words to say about this as representative of your now vast instrumental <laughs> acoustic? I know it can be a little bit confusing because if you go to Spotify, you're going to get a Hobbit track, then you're going to get something from my new album, then you're going to get something from The Herbs and Sim City. I mean, it's kind of weird and schizo, but I can't say enough about how fortunate I've been, how grateful I've been to be able to make a living in music. And it's a little unusual how I bounce around into different genres, but to me, it's been awesome. I can't be thankful enough. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, Mark.
All right, here's whiskey and pie. Thanks so much to Rod. A real pleasure to talk to him. He was very complimentary about how this was conducted and has such a deep, interesting catalog. I will link to more of it, including the full 1975 solo album and some of his other soundtrack work on the blog post associated with this at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. My next interview is with Josh Caterer from Smoking Popes. And I talked to Cahill Coughlin, who is the leader of Fatima Mansions and Micro Disney. Then I most recently spoke to Glenn Phillips, who, even if you don't know his name, you know his music. He was the lead singer for Toad the Wet Sprocket, a band that was huge in the early 90s, has reformed, and he's also done many folky solo albums and various interesting collaborations. So please come back for that. Make sure you're subscribed directly to this podcast through the Nakedly Examined Music feed, or through the Patreon feed, which will get you some bonus material. That's patreon.com slash music. Hope you're having a good start of your summer. I've been able to travel on a plane since last we spoke. A wonderful break from relative isolation. Also eat at some restaurants and do what used to be normal things. And fittingly, I got to visit my father, who is my biggest musical influence before all this rock and roll stuff corrupted me. Thank you so much for your attention. Until next time, keep on musicin'. This is Mark Lintonmeyer signing off. <laughs>